it's funny. I used to, I used to say, I was like, I wish I could go back in time and tell myself stuff that I know now, but then I'm like, I wouldn't listen to, I me. wouldn't have listened to me either. Like my parents and my uncles, like everybody told me stuff that I now know is true. Yeah. But back then, like, fuck off. I'll figure it out. I'm smart. I know what I'm doing. Yeah. No, you don't. You don't fucking know anything when you're 20. Yeah. You know, you know your dick and you're like, I like pussy. <laughs> this yeah. is what I want to yeah. do. No, you know, like whatever, you know, to, to whatever. That's a, I feel like that's a, what is it? Chris Rock bit or something. I think yeah. he talks about that. But, you know, like you're just out and that's, that's all it is. Yeah. And at that point, living wage doesn't matter. No. Because if you got laid, like. Who cares if you ate? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I'd go three days without eating if I could get laid. Let's do it. Blow your whole budget. I, I, I mean, I'm sure if you pro- proposed that question, most guys would be like, you can get laid or you don't eat for like the week. It's like, okay, yeah, I'll let's get, do this. I'll get laid. Let's go. Right? <laughs> Are we already rolling speed? Yeah. Oh, good. Well, we'll just tack that on at the beginning of the podcast. <laughs> Why not? I'm Nick. I'm JD. This is the dude cast. All right, episode eight. We are here, almost done season two already. Yeah, it's crazy how fast you know we sort of whip through the seasons. It's uh, yeah. Well, I mean, at this point, I think people are going to be listening to this in September or yeah. early October, something like that. So it's wild to be thinking that sort of that far in the future. But I mean, yeah, season two almost already almost in the can. Like we got a couple more episodes yet, but it's, yeah. it, it is. It's interesting how fast. And I mean, this summer has been crazy. Like we were talking in previous episodes, like I've, I've been doing the acting thing. I've been doing the golfing thing. Um, still working out, still losing. Did you know I'm down? I have lost 60 pounds of fat Oh wow! since September of last year. Wow. That's yeah. amazing. I know. I, I look at me and I'm like, I still look like a pudgy fucker, but I know I'm not. And my wife tells me, no, you look seriously different. And I can look at pictures and see how much more of a barrel that I had around my middle. Yeah. You know, but I still feel... Like I'm not there, you know, you know, I, I think, you know, and we were talking a couple episodes ago about age and, and pushing 40 and, yeah. and things like that. There, there's definitely, it is harder to maintain, you know, kind of that physique. You know, I, I retired from fighting professionally when I was like 34 and I mean, I was lean, like no body fat. Lean, mean fighting machine. Yeah. And you know, it's, you know, now I'm not that. Mm. And I mean, I'm active. I, yep. I mean, you know, I think we talked in season one, like I started the Peloton earlier. Yeah. Uh, you just I, like two, cro- crossed over your 200th kilometer or 2,000 two, kilometer? 200, 200, right. I'm like 3,000 kilometers yeah. plus. In. Either way though, it's a yeah. pretty big. I, I mean, it's a, it. it's a, it's a significant more amount of work cycling than I have been doing for a long time. And I mean, yeah. and I used to mountain bike all the time yeah. as well, although it was downhill mountain biking and free ride mountain biking. So there was a lot of shuttle to the top and ride down and right. do massive jumps and hucks and drops and tricks and all that kind yeah. of stuff. But you know, still there's, there's effort involved and of you're course, still yeah, pedaling sure. and you know, it's, it's, it's athletic in its own right. So, I mean, yeah, I mean, I, I don't see a big difference in myself and I mean, I know that I'm working like, mm. I know that when I come off there, it's like, I am soaked. Like if yep. I go near my wife, she's like, you do not touch me <laughs> at all. You know, it's like, come on, give a me shower. a hug. It's like, no, yeah. no, like get the fuck away from me. Right. You know, right now it's, uh, but, you know, you don't see those changes as fast. And, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting. Like when I used to fight, I used to walk around about 185 pounds. I would fight at 165. So I would cut 20 pounds like that. Yeah. Uh, you know, a lot of it water weight. And, sure. You know, kind of fake weight loss, which, right. you know, we all do. And, I mean, it's tough. It's tough mm-hmm. on the body. But, you know, it's, it's definitely a, a lot harder. You know, yeah. do I feel better? Sure. I mean, I, I, you know, I have more, you know, medical issues like my hip, which interestingly right. enough, you know, the doctor seems fairly impressed. I just went to him actually, I think a few weeks ago, uh, the specialist and, uh, he's like, well, you're not limping anymore, which is, which is huge because I've limped for a very, very long time. Right. Uh, he says, you know, it's, it's not great, but you're not, you're definitely not as bad as you were. Right. And, you know, he accounts a lot of it for, you know, cycling and working on it. Cause I mean, I was going to physio for a very, very long yep. time, three times a week and you know he, he's impressed you know at well, this good. point I'm not looking at hip replacement and even this time around uh, I did have a couple weeks where I was you know I was in excruciating pain and yeah. I was kind of like I need I need like relief and I thought I was going to go back and get hip injections but 
manage to somehow get through that, yep. break through that point. And the, even the injections, it's like, he's like, I'll see you again in six months. You know, it's, this is obviously an ongoing thing for sure, a very, very long time, yep. you know, cause I, I've been seeing the specialist, the specialist alone for over two years. Wow. Uh, and he's like, I'll see you again in six months, but if it gets to a point where it's unbearable, come see and we'll go get the injections done sure. right away. But you know, knock on wood, I, I'm, I, I've been fine, you know, and it's, it's, it's about taking care of yourself, you know? Yeah. You might not look like, you know, you know, the, the 16 year old surfer bod that you once had, Yeah. but you know, the, you know, your no, life it's, changes. It's, yeah, you know? no, your life changes and you're in a different phase. And I mean, I feel better now than I have probably in the last 10 years. Yeah. I have more energy. I sleep better. Um, to be perfectly frank, my sex life is better, Yeah. you know, and you can ask my wife, she will a hundred percent agree. Um, and I feel happier, yeah. like mentally, I'm a better person um, since getting back in shape and really dedicating myself to it. Eating well is a huge portion of, of, of the, you know, body fat cut down, but, you know, just training the muscles, training the body, training the mind to have that dedication and the, the consistent effort yeah. every day. You know, I, when I was younger, it used to be a lot about like lift and push as much as you possibly could at that, at that moment. And now it's like, no, you know what? I just want good, consistent effort every day to feel good. Yeah. And I find uh, last, last week or the week before, I think it was, no, it was two weeks ago. Cause I was doing the, the filming thing. Um, I had like three days basically where I didn't go to the gym cause I couldn't, I was, and you're going to feel that immediately. And I did by day three, I was like, Oh man, I feel like a piece of crap and my knee hurts and my back was sore. And I was like, what's going on? Oh geez. I haven't been to the gym. And then it's like, okay, I gotta get back. I gotta get back. And you do. And then suddenly it's like instantly you feel better, which is, it's kind of almost counterintuitive where you have to push your body and work hard to feel good. Yeah. I see this a lot um, with some older members of my family and older members of my wife's family where they're eight, they're aging and at the point now they're like, well, I've got this hip, I've got this knee, I've got this thing, I've got to take it easy. And I'm just like, no, get out, get walking, get the weight off, like keep moving. Cause if you don't keep moving, you're just going to perish. Yep. Like it's so crazy to me how fragile our bodies are. And yet at the same time, how much punishment they can actually take and and you feel good about it. Yeah. <laughs> I bring this up too because <clears throat> my wife has started running. She started uh, running kind of in secret around the same time last year that I started uh, bodybuilding again or, 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 you know, weight training and whatnot. And uh, she didn't want to tell me at first because, like, I'm not a big runner. I never have been. Right, right. Um, but I'm always, I've always been about, you know, keeping in good shape and feeling good and, and whatever. But she really, really enjoys it. She's lost a lot of weight and she's toned now. And she actually has more muscle than I think she ever has had before. She also does weight training and stuff as well. Um, but uh, it's the same thing for her. She's like, if I don't run by day two or day three, I feel like I feel really bad and things start to hurt. And she had a, she's had a couple injuries with um, some car accidents and stuff and her ankle and her knee aren't great. Um, but, and I don't know exactly why, but she's like, oh, I got to take it easy for like three or four days or three or four weeks, I should say. But the pain wouldn't go away. And so she was finally, and I, I'm not going to push her one way or the other, because that's probably the worst thing you can possibly do with yeah. a partner is push them to do anything. Um, but she's like, I got to go out for a run. And I was like, are you, are you ready? She's like, no, but I got to do it. And she came back and she's like, I feel great. The pain in my knee's gone. I'm like, well, you're full of you know, endorphins. Let's see how you feel in like six hours. And she was fine. She's like, no, I'm good to go again. And I'm like. Okay, cool. There it is. It's like yeah. proof. You got to just keep going. And obviously if there's like actual serious injuries or, you know, a, a thing that's going on, whatever. <laughs> the thing is, is that I think short of breaking something, yeah, you know, or, you know, sort of that acute damage that gets done right away. Like you, you smash your elbow, it swells up. Yeah, and exactly. It, you know, causes you a bunch of a pain. You have to let the swelling, you know, yep. subside a little or bit. Slip a but even, even then, you know, it's, you know, training while you're injured is possible. Like yeah. I, I used to play, you know, basketball in university. Uh, and, and I mean, I'm a little guy, so I get smashed around all the time. And I, I, I I'd sprain my ankle every once in a while. Right. When I sprained my ankle, I didn't just go sit on the sidelines and watch everybody practice. You know, uh, that's what some people do. You know, you would, you would sit there and you would stretch. And then a lot of time what would be is you would get on the bike and you would have zero resistance because you're, you're trying to... You keep know, the joint moving, right? You're trying to keep the joint moving, but you're also trying to keep moving yourself and mm. do a little bit of cardio. I mean, it's not 
you know, the biggest exertion in the world, but you know, during a hour and a half, two hour practice, you moved that whole time. Number one, so your fitness level didn't just kind of like drop off a cliff. But number yeah. two, it's it's active recovery. Yeah, you know, uh, so if you look at cycling, you know, and, and like I said, I'm doing a lot of cycling. Is that? Yeah, I, I I can I can ride every day. I don't push hard every day. Yeah, you know, I, I push hard, but I don't like you know. I'm not out to set a personal record sure. every day. Of course not. You know, there are days that I I put in a 45 minute hour ride, and it's you know. I'm I'm just, you know, kind of keeping a good consistent pace. I'm not yeah. trying to set any land speed records, but it's it's active recovery. You're For you're sure. still letting your body rest because you're not putting it, you know, in, up in, you know, yeah. you know, zone 6 or 7. Yeah. Um, you know, I don't know if anybody does FTP training, but that's what I have it typically to do. I know exactly where I am based on heart rate and efforts. Right. You know, you're not burning the red line the whole time. No, you know, sometimes well, you're sitting we're not back. meant to. No, you shouldn't. No. And that's when you're going to get yourself injured and really, exactly. really hurt. Because you know? if you do that every single day, yeah. like you said, you're going to be injured or hurt by day three, by day yeah. four, because your body's tired and you can't recover properly. Yeah. You can work at 60 to 70 to 80% yeah. capacity every day. And that's not going to hurt you. You're going to feel good. You're going to be good. Uh, you'll continue to get better. But if you try to push it, redline it every single time, like, you, yeah. and, and your performance will actually decrease over time. If you're trying to redline every single time you're on oh, the yeah, bike yeah. or every single time you're squatting or whatever it happens to be right. You need a period of rest as well, but it's important to keep moving. I was just listening to a Joe Rogan excerpt. Um, he had on a Brazilian jujitsu guy from, from Montreal, yeah. um, talking about this kind of thing where it's important to get into a state of flow where you're you're actively training and you're actively practicing but you're not going as hard as you possibly can because you shouldn't every no, single time no no absolutely not yeah it was a really it was a fascinating i don't know maybe a 10 minute clip or whatever he's got some really cool guests on there yeah um about all sorts of different stuff but you know i i seem to always find like the <laughs> i seem to find the fitness ones they because youtube knows what i like um but i, I find the fitness ones and then the ones with like um uh, mind altering drugs and or uh, right, and, right. and stuff about physics and stuff. I'm not a drug user. I never have been, but I find it fascinating. Um, that instance of clarity or instance of, um, uh, revelation that people have when they take these substances. I find it's a, a very interesting. I don't know um, if they have it thing. during or if it's after. Yeah. You know what I, I mean? I, I've never done I, it. So I'm, I have I'm no curious. Idea. Oh, I, I have no point of reference either, but you know, it's, it's kind of, you wonder if they have those moments of clarity at like after the whole thing's done, like, whoa, you know, like, right. That like I'm really waking trippy. from a dream kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Or if it's, you know, something that's like, so totally psychosis induced kind of, you yeah. know, revelations or, or what the case, you know, I guess I should uh, probably talk to Lloyd more about <laughs> yeah, those he things. Might know, right? He might, he might have those, those, those things on speed dial, but yeah. uh, you know, it's interesting, you know. I'm I'm not a drug user either, but you know, I love stoner movies and yeah, you know, well, it's kind funny. of stuff. It's it, I find it interesting, probably yeah. because I have no frame of reference, right? Right. You know, so for me, it's like this is this is entertaining. I find the people entertaining for sure. I, I find it interesting to talk to them because a lot of times, like they're way out there. Like sure, sometimes they, they don't have no clue what they're talking about, and right. they think they're just having the most intelligent conversation that they've ever had, right. and they're not. But, you know, and maybe that's part of that revelation part is that they think they're having a revelation and they're not really. But right. Joe Rogan's a lot more put together, than, I think, than, I, a, than, lot a, other than people, a lot of right? people. He's, he's a, he's a, he, he is, you know, I mean, he's, he's a comedian. He's obviously a show host as well. But, yep. you know, I think he is a very intellectual guy. He puts yep. a lot of good thought into things and he's well-educated and well-read. Seems to know? be anyway. You know, so. You know, and he's got, uh, and of course he's got a training background, MMA, yeah. Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. Taekwondo. Um, Taekwondo, like he was competitive and he's pretty heavily into the um, the MMA uh, community. I, think, I don't know if he owns or if he's just a partner with um, the promotion the MMA promotion, the big oh, one. Oh, UFC? UFC. I, I think he's just uh He's hired, just partnered with them a hired to, gun, to do you the know, he's commentary and whatnot. Yeah. But either way, I mean, like, he's he's in that world, and he t he kind of touches so many different things, so he, he knows so many different people. Yeah. One of the more interesting guests that he had on was um, this guy named Paul Stamets, who is, like, Mr. Mushroom. And uh, he, in fact, they actually named a character, uh, Paul Stamets, in the new Star Trek Discovery series. Um, without going into too much detail, if people have watched Star Trek Dis Discovery, the, the ship is powered by what they call a spore drive. So it's basically this um, alternate 
reality inside of our reality, which is they call the mycelial network. So it's like these spores, mushrooms basically that live within the cosmos and you can somehow harness their power. And there's like all this sort of pseudoscience behind it or whatever else, but he was kind Somebody of, somebody must've been really fucking high with Yeah, I that. think so. And he, do, and they talk openly about doing, um, psilocybin and all yeah. that kind of stuff. Um, but they, they used him as this inspiration for this character. And he was a consultant actually on, uh, the, the new discovery series talking about mushrooms and kind of how they work and different things because you know it, it, it's really fascinating mycelial networks underpin every living organism on planet earth which is funny like and and they're not sure whether they were aliens quote unquote or if it was actually something that was here but if you look at any um destroyed ecosystem like let's like talk about like very um relevant in alberta prairies and, and bc with the mountains uh wildfires after wildfires, you have this massive black charred expanse of nothingness. Yeah. And the first thing to pop through is mushrooms. They come up and they actually start to eat the charcoal and they eat the, the, the ruin. And then they make fertile soil and then green plants can come back. And then little animals that come back to eat the little grasses and things and then trees and so on and so forth. So they're very, very important for kind of every living biome on earth. And there's some proof to show that um like a mycelial like a um a mushroom uh what do you call it? like a colony here in alberta will actually be related physically to ones in bc and in montana and like they're they're massive and they stretch across the like fingers underneath the soil it's it's pretty really it, it's really neat yeah yeah, I know. Now I'm sounding like some sort of weird, like, <laughs> revelation. Well, we, we we all know that you like Star Trek, and that's that's your jam. So. Yeah, no, it, it's it's fascinating. But I do I find I find the whole mushroom thing quite amazing. And again, it's like North America. We lost touch with a lot of our holistic roots. Like, I'm not into naturopathy. I'm not into homeopathy. Like, I think it's a bunch of bullshit. But there are natural remedies and um, herbs and. Uh, fungi and things that we can eat that will help us digest and help us overcome disease and whatever. And we've really lost a lot of that in North America. You know, Europe, it's still pretty big. China is huge. Medicinal mushrooms, medicinal teas, that kind of thing. I feel um, China goes to the <coughs> the other extreme though, where it's, you know, they kind of, you know, maybe some a little stuff, too much. Yeah. You know, like yeah. the, the shark fin soup and, you know, it's right. like all that kind of stuff. Eat, you know, tusk and weird right. kind of, you know, well, I mean, they, I'm sure they have their fair share of snake oil as yeah. well. I mean, like anybody does, but I feel like there's a, a, a long tradition there of researched and studied and, um, tracked, you know, medicinal herbs and things like, oh, I'm, you know, I'm feeling this. Okay. Well, you need a preparation of this, right. herb, this herb and this mushroom, put it in a tea. And, 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 and on a base level, it's probably baseline chemistry is what yeah, it really comes down for to. Sure. It's like these things have certain properties mixed together. It, it helps with that. And I mean, you know, it's, it's like anything. It's like opiates, you know, pulled out of flowers and, you mm -hmm. know, granted that, you know, opiates can, <laughs> when processed, get, get a little out of control yeah, absolutely. as we've seen, but you know, there's always sort of a natural base to it. And that's found at some point, you know, and that's, uh, that's why, like you said, you know, eating certain mushrooms or certain things or having certain things in your diet again, you know, sort of going back to the discussion we had, I think a couple of episodes ago as well is that unprocessed stuff is more likely better for you because it's not pulling it, extracting stuff out, you know, a bunch of, you know, crappy frozen mushrooms in your TV dinner probably yeah. don't have the same nutritional value as something fresh and you cook that yourself. Yeah, exactly. Although I, w I would say now probably more than 50 years ago, certainly. Um, but preservation, uh, preservative and, um, freezing techniques are much better now than they were even 10 years ago. Yeah. Um, certainly 50 years ago. Um, you know, not that a TV dinner is the, you know, pinnacle of, of nutrition, but I feel like you, you get a, a much better taste and a much better, um, nutritional content out of like frozen vegetables now than you would have like when I was a kid, Yeah, you know? Um, and of course, fresh is always best, Yeah, you know, if you can get it. But I mean, again, if you're, if you're, it's cheap and it's convenient to have frozen stuff, you know what I mean? Uh, interesting conversation I was having with my wife not too long ago, and it kind of gets back to almost something we were talking about last episode with like the whole minimum wage thing. And, uh, one of the reasons I think people are upset with 
you know, low minimum wages, you see these corporations like Walmart or like Costco or whatever, making these huge, huge profits and paying their people not very much money. And Amazon, for example, yeah. at the end of the day, there is no such thing as an ethical consumer, right? I will go out and buy what is the cheapest thing I can buy to do the thing that I need. Unless a friend, a family member, or someone I know in my community for sure makes or produces this thing, you know, and I want to support that person. But other than that, I'm going to go try and find the cheapest option. And where does that cheapest option exist? It's usually Walmart or Amazon. Yeah. You know, I've changed that behavior in the last little bit. Uh, you know, I, I would say I'm making a conscious effort to do it, you know, instead of, you know, like corner stores, for example, I have a corner store about a block away from here. Yep. Uh, I will go there because it's independently owned. Okay. So it's not a Seven Eleven. Uh, it's not a Seven Eleven. It's not a chain, anything yep. like that. The guys that are working in there own the spot. They've cool. got some weird stuff because there's like a ton of bongs and shit in there. Yeah. You know, <laughs> it's, you know, which which kind of makes me happy because it makes it a lot more Kevin Smith. Sure. You know, kind of movie. Yeah. Okay. Thing. You know, I like my, I think my life's like a Kevin Smith movie sometimes. Nice. But do you, you hang know, out I, out front in front of the wall? I, and I've asked. <laughs> ironically, I've asked them about filming there and stuff like yeah. that. And they're totally down with nice. you know all sorts of stuff. But uh, yeah, I'll go there and and I'll, and I'll buy stuff there. Is it more expensive? Yes. What is it more expensive? 10, 20 cents. Okay, fine. Right. Right. It's but to me, huge. at least it's going to somebody that's working and putting in an effort is independently, sure. you know, working and, you know, it's, it just seems to be a better investment. Same thing with, you know, uh, baked goods. I go to the bakery now, found a bakery close by. So I, I go there. I don't nice. buy them from Superstore anymore. Yeah. You know, it's, it's relatively close, you know, it's. And I'm starting to make those changes again where I feel it's a lot more, you know, home based. Like the bakeries, you know, they're, you know, there's, there's people working there. They employ people, but it's not a massive, you know, right. chain like superstore. Yep. You know, it's, they're employing people directly. And I feel that the money is going to a much better place than right. a large corporation. Well, it's staying here in the community, yeah. I guess. Is so, you know. So that's, I mean, that's huge. And I mean, it's not everything. Like, I mean, I'm not going to lie. I still buy stuff off Amazon. Sure. I'll still, you know, import stuff from China off Amazon because it's dirt cheap and I'm yep. not going to Walmart to buy it. Yeah. You know, I definitely do those things. Yeah. You know, and I try to save as much money as I can most of the time. But, you know, I'm trying to make like little changes, I think, that are or feel that are a little more impactful because I want to see, you know, things like that bakery stick around for yeah. the next 20 well, years. Well, and that's huge. If you can, if you if there are things in your community that you like, you need to frequent them. Yeah. Right? W whatever the business, if it's a bar, if it's a bakery, if it's the barbershop, like whatever it happens to be, if you're not going to it on a relatively regular basis, that shop will go away. Yeah. You know, um, and, and, or will be more likely to sell out to one of the larger conglomerates and then it will be gone. And then all yeah. we're going to be, you know, it's, it, it's strange too. I don't know if the UK is like this, but like, I remember as a kid traveling with my mom and the dad, <laughs> my mom and the dad, my mom and dad in the car and we would leave our hometown and, you know, you'd drive for two or three hours and you'd stop in the next town and fill up a gas and you'd have whatever. And I remember every little town through Ontario used to look different. Yep. You know, um, and there'd be like, you know, Paul's bakery and, and, uh, Charla's soup kitchen, whatever. And then you'd go to the next place and it would be, uh, Robbie's pie shop and it would be somebody else's like, and these little mom and pops, whatever. Now I feel like when you drive across Canada and you go to, it doesn't matter whether you're in Alberta or in Ontario or in BC, you pull in every strip mall looks the same. And they've got like a brick and a Boston pizza yep. and a McDonald's and a whatever. And it's like, where did the character go? Like, yeah. What happened? I, you, you know, I, I think it's a problem that's kind of globally as well. I, I think it's like that in the UK as well. Last time that I went home, I noticed there were, you know, kind of like the the typical strip mall outlet box store kind of area where it's, you know, you've, like you said, you've got Best Buy, you've yeah. got, you know, a Boston pizza, you've got all these kind of chains that are all kind of lumped in there and whatever chain has appeared there, Tim Hortons, you know, which yeah. are everywhere, you know, and, and that's kind of the thing. And, I, and I, it's, it's, it's taking away, you know, uh, in the UK, they always call them high street, you know, so the main street, right. You know, those, those places are dying and they're just not doing the business that they were. And, you know, even my cousin was, who was just here, 
you know, uh, we were talking about, uh, you know, sort of back home and stuff. And he's like, you know, like the, the strip mall where I used to go. And I think I've talked about this many times where I would go by, you know, the fish or I go, go to the butcher, I go to the baker, I would go to, you know, the, the grocer, which is, you know, everything that those guys aren't, you know, you wouldn't buy beef or anything there. They might have a small selection, but you know, all these little independent, uh, you know, they're all gone because of things like Asda, which is their kind of big, you know, food chain, chain. store or whatever. So, I mean, it's, to me, it's kind of, it's kind of, it's kind of sad because, mm-hmm. you know, we give up number one, I think, you know, a lot of quality and care yep. because a lot of people working there just don't care and it's all, you know, mass produced processed, and it just kind of gets thrown on the shelf and that, that's go, kind yeah. of it. And it's such a high turnover that they just keep on doing that. Yes. It's maybe brought costs down a little bit, but again, you know, where's the money going? It's, it's all getting sucked out of the community. And that's, you know, kind of the, the big thing I think with a lot of these large corporations like the Walmarts, the Amazon and all these kind of things, like we've talked about cost of living, getting higher for individuals and it's costing you more. You know, it, the fact is, is that these places they're pulling the money out of the community. You know, so, yeah. and we talked about tax breaks and all that is that when they get paid, you know, just because you buy something from Amazon in Calgary doesn't mean your dollars stay in Calgary. They completely don't. They don't even stay in Canada necessarily. Yeah, they just the most completely part. get sucked out. And I think that's a dangerous trend. Globalization is a dangerous trend because yeah. then you're just kind of like cattle well, at the end of the day. And I mean, it's almost, I don't know that it's inevitable, but I feel like it's inevitable to the Western version of capitalism that's happened since 1960-ish, yeah, where it's a consolidation of power, right? So if you look back, even to the 80s, there used to be across Canada, um, I don't know how many, but like hundreds of tiny little local cable stations. And I'm sure you've seen this with photography and whatnot. There's like two. There's Bell Media and there's Chorus Entertainment. Yep. That's it. Yep. And they own everything. And it's the same in the States. There used to be hundreds, thousands of local producers, local cable companies, local um, television studios and movie uh, production places, facilities, whatever else. There's like four and two of them are both owned by Disney. Yeah. Right. It's just that it's, it's almost inevitable because you have to continue growing and you have to continue eating up other small businesses to, to keep the machine going. And I'm going to sound like a Marxist or something, but I'm like, where does it end? Yeah. I, because there will, there's eventually, there's a finite point. So what's going to happen? There's going to be one corporation that rules them all. Yeah. Like the seeing eye of Sauron at the top. Like, I mean, you know, I don't know. It's, it's crazy. Like it's a, it's a scary process, you know, yeah. and, and it's a scary prospect. But I think there's a lot that people can do if they think about it in their day to day and do it. You know, you don't absolutely. have to go eat at McDonald's. No. You know, you could go to Boogie's Burgers. Yeah. You know, on Boogie's Center makes Street. a good burger. You know, you. you can go to all these, you know, different little, you know, then there's some smaller chains like, what is it? Uh, I'm trying to think. I always want to call it 403 Burger, but it's not. It's like 308 or something like that. They had oh, one. Oh, yeah, Burger 308, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, it's, uh, you can go to these little places or like Regrub. You yep. know, they have one down uh, on the old Electric Ave and then they have one up in Deerfoot City. So, you you know, they have a couple locations, but mm-hmm. they're, they're local. You can go support these places. Versus going to, you know, the large chains and, yeah. you know, spending your money there. You know, it's, I, I, I think people, you, you, you can take a little bit back, you know, yeah, for and sure. say like, I, I really don't want this. Yeah. You know, but again, it gets back to my comment about the ethical consumer, right? Because but I, I that's feel exactly, the most part, it's the, it's the convenience, it's the cost, um, and the availability, you know, and most people over the past, like, again, I, I feel like it's been the past 30, maybe 35 years where these changes, these shifts have happened, where it's just become the norm. You know, you, you go to McDonald's with your mom. I think familiarity is, is a bigger part of it than anything else. Yeah. You know, it's, I think that being familiar and comfortable with something is something that people are more inclined to. Like, I mean, it's, it's interesting because, you know, I've traveled the world and, and I've traveled with different people and it's, it's funny when you go somewhere, you know, you're like in Asia and it's like, Oh, there's a McDonald's. Let's go to McDonald's. Like why the hell would yeah, we go to McDonald's? Go to like McDonald's at home. look at all this street food here, but there's some comfort knowing like 
it's it's going to taste like this. It's going to look like this. You know, the size is going to be like this. I know this is going to fill me up. You know, it's it's kind of sad that we just kind of run in this linear line sometimes, and that yeah. we're scared to kind of venture out. Yeah. You know, my favorite part about travel is, is is all the experiencing of all the different things. But I think as humans, that we like kind of you know that comfort. Yeah, we like the familiarity for sure, and, and the security, and it's not necessarily for a good reason other than that. Yeah. You know. I don't think anybody eats McDonald's because, you know, it's like their favorite food in the world. Yeah, I don't know. Some people maybe. Like there's like that Big Mac guy. He goes and has a Big Mac every single day and he's done it for the past like 40 years or something. They, and like, he's alive? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> where is he? I think he's like in Seattle, I think. They, yeah. There was like a TV. I saw a special like on the, the news or something about him. And uh, I'm going to just stop this real quick and then restart it. But um, they like celebrated him. I can't, like, what do they call him? Mr. Big Mac? something like that. And he, and he, he literally every single day goes and has a Big Mac and a Coke. Oh. And that's, that's just his thing that he does for lunch. Um, and he loves McDonald's so much. Like he got married at McDonald's, his wife. I don't know. It, it's a, it's a little weird. Like it's over the top for right. sure. But you know, there are definitely those people that love whatever it is that they love. Yeah, they but just give you too much food there. You know, it's anywhere. It's, though, it's, really. it's interesting as well. You know, um, I go to McDonald's occasionally, and uh, what I what I've done now is now I get like a cheeseburger yep. or a hamburger, or you know whatever a single patty like burger, small fries, and then usually I grab water because I don't drink soda. Right, but it's that's it, you mm. know. And, and I think about it to back you know way back when like that was the norm. Yeah, it wasn't these you know giant big macs and quarter pounders with cheese no. or anything like that that was the normal portion but that's you know that's that's nothing now that's not a normal no. kind of meal well, and i mean i remember when they changed over to the happy meal well, not the happy meal but like the actual value meals yeah because you never used to be able to do that and i remember going when i was a kid my mom would ask me okay would you like a fish burger a cheeseburger or french fries yeah it wasn't you get a burger and fries you had one or the other yeah because in a fries is like as much calories as a burger. So it was, you know, one, yeah. one or the other. And that was the norm when I was a kid. And then I, th- I think it was like when I was around nine or 10, I think it was like 88, 89, something like that. It changed. Then they did the extra value meal thing. So now it became the norm to have a burger and fries and a drink. Yeah. You don't need that much food. No, no. You know, and I, I do the same thing. I mean, I haven't gone, well, I went to McDonald's this morning. I brought us some coffee. Yeah. And I had a, I had a breakfast sandwich. Coffee's I, one thing. I don't usually go to have like a meal. The last time I went, I had a burger and I got myself a diet soda and that was it. And she's like, oh, don't you want an extra value meal? And I was like, no, no, just the burger. And the, she's like, oh, it's cheaper. And I was like, uh, I don't think so. And she's like, yeah, no, no, it's cheaper if you get the meal. And I'm like, no, it's not. And she's like, I said, so how much is my burger and, and the, and the soda? And, uh, it was, you know, six seventy five or something. And I was like, okay. And so how much is the meal? $8. I'm like, that's not cheaper. She's like, oh, well it's cheaper per item. I'm like, sure. That's cheaper per item. If I want each yeah, if one you of want those to items, eat all those items, but I don't want to eat all that stuff. I just need the burger. Thank you. But again, it's just that, that mindset of how we've kind of been trained as consumers to eat all yeah. of this food, but we don't need it. Well, I'll go to Tim Hortons every once in a while. Same thing. You know, I'll go there and I'll get a, a sandwich or a bagel, you know, like a BLT kind of thing. Yeah. And get, grab a coffee and you know, they're like, do you want a hash brown or donut? And I'm like, no. Yeah. And every time. Like, yeah, it's, it's, it's automatically trained in them. I mean, it's upselling it. Yeah, it's, of course. And that's uh, just, know. it's business. But I get it. It's, you know, it's, it's crazy to me. And, and a lot of times it's based on that value thing, right? You know, it's yeah. like, oh, it's only, you know, 20 cents more, 30 cents more and you'll get this. And it's like, but I don't need that. No. You know, people forget, you know, it's, we, we very, very easily forget that we don't need to eat that much. Yeah. That's the other big thing. I don't, to kind of bring it back to almost where we started this particular podcast, yeah. but bring it back to my weight loss over the past year. It's completely changed my relationship with food. Um, cause I will fully admit that I used to eat out of boredom or I would eat, I was a big stress eater. Um, and I was an overeater cause I enjoyed it also, but I enjoyed yeah. the feeling of fullness and I, whatever, but you don't need that. And it's amazing to me now how little I eat compared to how much I used to eat. Um, and I feel full and yeah. I feel satisfied. Um, and it's so different than, and I go out with people that haven't gone and I'm not preachy about it because I don't care live your life do what you want right but 
it, it's amazing to me how much people will eat when we go out and I'm like, I can fully like I'll eat and I'm like, yeah, I'm full and I'll just leave it or I'll bring it home. Like if it was yeah. especially delicious, I'll bring it again. A that's a bag North American thing. Portions are, are, are a huge Massive. thing here. because anybody that comes and visits from here. And, and I mean, if you eat out in the UK, it's not a cheap endeavor No, ever. Uh, you know, it's, it's a way, way more expensive over there. Although my cousin did note that things are, it used to be like super, super cheap here, right. you know, but it's a lot more on par now. Right. I uh, noticed that uh, when he came, you know, and that, that includes things like McDonald's, which I, I find kind of interesting because it used to be so, so different. Yeah. You know, but uh, he's like, the portions here are ridiculous. Yeah. He, they don't need it, you know. No. It's, we we were just out for dinner with some friends of ours uh, last week, and um, for dessert, everybody wanted to try this uh, cheesecake creation or whatever that the restaurant had. And uh, everybody, like Lisa and I were going to share one. And uh, the other couple that we were with both wanted to order one. And I said, well, before you do that, let's just get the one because Lisa and I are going to share this, but we will not be able to eat all of it. Let's just get one and we'll get four spoons. And they're like, oh, no, no, that's ridiculous. And I'm like, trust me on this. And I said, if it's not enough, then obviously order it because they're going to have a bazillion and they'll want to sell us two more if you guys really like it. But trust me, it came out and it was like half of, or not half. It was like a quarter of a, of a cake. Yeah. I'm like, yeah, that is not a single serving. It's like 3000 calories worth of cheesecake. And sure enough. Yeah. So we came out and everybody enjoyed it. And I had a little bit, my wife had a little bit, they had a little bit and there was still left over. I'm just like, this is, and it's, but you know, again, yeah. Serving sizes. Value See, for money, and, and, like and I think part of the psychology is too, is that if you order something like that, right? if you were to order it yourself, go out yourself, you order this thing, you're probably going to finish it, not because you're not enjoying it still, or not because you should, or you, you know, it's because you feel that you've paid this money and that you should, and it's wasteful otherwise. Exactly. Yeah, for sure. You know, There's rather than giving you a, a decent portion that's more than satisfying and, yeah. you know. Again, and, and, you know, potentially we're, you know, we're talking about things before as well. Like maybe, you know, cut down on the portion size, cut down on the costs and, you know, you'd, yeah. you'd have more people going out because I mean, at a point it's, it's getting, you know, kind of a little bit ridiculous. Well, it is. And again, we, we, we talked previously about your trip to Malaysia and I'm planning a trip to Japan in the new year and, um, portion sizes in Asia are still very small Yeah, and you go out to a restaurant and you'll have a little plate of food or whatever. And if you look at the actual content of it, it's actually all you need. Yeah. Um, or you can share and then you can get a couple different entrees or whatever else. But I mean, it's still that culture there is going out to eat going out to be social, going out to have a drink and some teppanyaki or whatever. Um, and it's kind of the norm. So that's usual, but like here it's just, it's kind of that opposite where it is almost now the norm to go out and eat, but we're still in that like mindset of we need to get like the best value for our thing. And we have to have this huge thing and I ordered it. So I got to eat it all. Like, yeah, it's just a weird. It's interesting. Cause I went out, uh, and you know, I, I do the vlogging thing and I go out and I, and I like to explore Calgary just to see what there is yeah. because I've been here for years and there's always something new. Mm -hmm. And there was a vegan street, you know, food place and I got vegan fish tacos, which were actually good, which cool. had no fish in is it, it like whatsoever. Tofu or something? Or no, it was, uh, I can't remember exactly what it was. It was like some weird root or something. It tastes like fish. Cool. When you deep fry it, whatever. Um, tasted good, had mangoes only. Nice. But for two tacos, like two little like tacos and a sparkling water, twenty bucks. Wow. You know, it's yeah. To and and, and to me like that's like street food. Yeah. You know, whereas in like I said, Malaysia it was like two bucks and you had like, you know, pork and all sorts of like you had more food than you'd ever need. Yeah. And it just doesn't quite equate. And, and I mean, $20 is not cheap. So it makes me wonder, you know, sort of where, where we're going at this point, you know, is, is Calgary kind of, you know, moving into that kind of metropolis, you know, I think sometimes Calgary thinks it's bigger than it is, Yeah, you know, but at the same time, I mean, we got a million and a quarter people, Yeah, you know, it's, it's getting up there. There is, it's a large, it is a big city. Yeah. But yeah, I don't, I don't $20 think, street food. Yeah, no, that's insane. You it's know? insane. But a lot of that is also, again, you look at the business, it's 
it's the licensing that they have to pay um, and the checkups that they have to pay for yeah. and the, all the, like there's all these fees like in Canada and Calgary, especially I find that this, they nickel and dime us to the yeah. end. Somebody sent me, I, and you know, you're gonna have to forgive me for this cause I hadn't read the article yet. Sure. But somebody sent me basically saying that we got taxed more. We paid more in tax last year than we did in our average household living expenses. So it's kind of interesting. interesting, you know, and, and I thought about it. I'm like, no, that can't be. That's ridiculous because my power bill is this. And then I'm like thinking about the power bill. I'm like, well, no, tax, you know, at that time it was like carbon tax. And then there's like rider fees and all these other taxes that are tacked on. And then my yeah. actual power consumption is like minimal. Yeah. But it's all these other things that make it, you know, a ridiculous 200 plus yeah bill, it's right? insane it's you know insane. and then i'm thinking well tax wise you know you pay a good chunk of tax like you know it's it, it's possible it's it's possible i don't know if it's accurate yeah but it's interesting but they were comparing the burden and again you know sort of going back in time to like 1960 something you know the tax burden now is huge you know and you know it's 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 an interesting thing you know it's you know i i think you know we're we're kind of at one of those weird junctures you know, in society is like, where are we going with this? You know, like, mm -hmm. you know, where, where are we going to go and where are we going to end up? You know, yeah. I, I'm very much, I always tell people like I'm a, I'm a libertarian. I, I, you know, I'm all about like no government interference, no people interference. Just let me live my life. I'm not yeah. going to bother anybody. And as long as that happens, yeah, who cares? Right. Yeah, exactly. You know, so it'll be, be interesting. But to it's see. interesting. Yeah, exactly. With an aging population and so forth. Um, that tax burden has to, has to be like the, the burden to pay for it all because we have a government that takes care, takes care of the population generally. Um, there are fewer and fewer people working and more and more people retiring out and the shift is doing this. And it's like, well, what happens once you reach, reach that tipping point? Like if you look at Japan right now, there are more people retired and getting ready to die. And that's a horrible way to put it, but there's more people doing that than there are being born and entering the workforce. So they've already flipped that point. What do you do at that point? Yeah. You know, again, it's like this unsustainable capitalism thing. It's like, well, there's a finite amount of resource. What happens when you hit the wall? I don't know. It's going to be weird. Yeah. Hopefully you know how to hunt. <laughs> Right, you know how to hunt, I'm, I'm you know good. How to fish. You know how to like sew your own clothes because I feel and, like we and, might get and to you that know point. What? That's that's that's, a, that's an interesting thing because I mean, you know, with me, you know, I, I was brought up a little bit different. Like my my grandfather was from uh, Latvia. Uh, he you know escaped here during World War Two. Uh, so him and my grandmother were were from Eastern Europe. They escaped you know to the UK. And my my other grandfather is is Scottish, and and my grandmother is actually Egyptian. Um, because he met her during World War II, but a big part of that thing because there, you know, they they came out of you know World War II, and it was a much different time. Yep. And you know, uh, my one grandfather served, and you know, my other grandfather obviously fled a country across all of Europe to end up in the UK. Yeah, and it's kind of like this is how you survive off the land. This is yep. how you do this. This, you know, here's a pocket knife. This is how you, you know, it's how you make fish stuff. This is how yep. you make snares. Like I, you know, we would go camping yep. and I'm not talking about North American camping, which I think is a ridiculous thing. You hook up a, you know, tent trailer and go out and park it and yep. drink beer and have, you know, all the, you know, confines, your, you know, luxuries of home, but you just sleep in a tent trailer you know, it's, it's not like that. It's like we go out in the bush and it's like you go and you do this you and you fish and you, you yep. do this. So, I mean, that's, that's what I grew up with because I think they thought it was going to be a different world because we we're also at that point moving into cold war with Ronald Reagan and, yep. uh, I can't remember uh, Gorbachev from, from yeah. Russia and there was a lot of tension and they thought there was going to be another world war. So, I mean, it was right. just kind they of, kind I think of in a weird you. way, you know, kind of like, Hey, just in case this happens, which thankfully it never did. Yeah. But you know, it's, it's a different skill set. And, yeah. and I mean, it, it's funny because, you know, uh, when, when I was filming my films, the mountain bike films, we would go out into the desert uh, in Utah and we would, we would film there for a month, month and a half. Right. And we'd have, you know, we'd have vehicles and we'd have water and we'd have supplies. I mean, it wasn't like we were like hardcore stuff, but I would do things like uh, uh, trenching and, and uh, build like uh, water traps. And like guys are like, what the hell are you doing? I'm like, building water traps because we're going to use this to wash and all this kind of stuff. It's like, well, we have water. I'm like, that's to drink. Yeah. 
because <laughs> that's, been, that's been purified. This, uh, like, there's no water in this desert, but when the condensation goes at night because it gets really cold and stuff, we can still fill up and we can still use this stuff. And yeah. they're just like, you're nuts. Yeah. And then about, you know, three weeks in, you know, it's like, oh, okay, now we understand because the water, like, you don't realize how much water you actually drink. How much you actually need, yeah. You know, and, you know, how much you're actually out there sweating and because you're filming and you're riding and so on and so mm-hmm. forth. So, I mean, it's it's interesting because people, you know, it's, it's your point of reference, right? It's, yeah. You know, a yeah, lot absolutely. of people, I think if... If the world ended tomorrow and you've lived in a city all your life, you're going to have a tough time, you know, and you know, this is true. I mean, I'm going to harp on vegans for, for, for a minute there, but like, you know, <laughs> it's, if, if you haven't, you know, caught or grown your own food, that's a, that's a tough, that's a, a tough, tough adjustment. Going, yeah. From, from, from nothing to you know, feeding yourself and, and, and even carnivores for that matter, you know, like a you know, vegan argument that, like, you know, you shouldn't kill animals. Like a lot of people just, they don't have the heart to do that. Sure. No, of you course know? not. If you had to kill your own food, I think a lot of less people would eat meat. Could be, you know? could be. Um, yeah, I wouldn't have a problem, but that's, no, I, that's me. Neither, neither would I, but I mean, I, again, I grew up camping and yeah. surviving and like my, I think farm you kids, know. you know, in Canada would do really well. But yeah. And they're, they'll be fine. But I mean, I, yeah, you're right. I think the, the city folk are going to have a major, major problem. And the, the thing is in Canada, I think a lot of people are now moving away from the farms and moving away from the rural areas yeah. to be more in the city. Um, and I mean, it's a problem across all of North America, but, um, we've gotten really soft really yeah, soft yeah. over the past 20, 30 years. Yeah. <laughs> and on that note, I think we'll call it a day on this episode of the dude cast yeah. <laughs> on the dark, dark episode. Next time on the dude cast, we're going to talk about survivalism and what, what, right. how to, how to survive after the apocalypse. <laughs> <laughs> I've been Nick. I'm JD. We'll see you again. Don't be a soft ass. <laughs>